All right, hello. The way we work is no longer working. With all of the advancements that this new century has brought, we have yet to substantially improve the basic constructs of work that we live with. Constructs that were, for the most part, invented 50 to 100 years ago. I came face to face with this challenge in my first job after college. I was a fundraising associate at the Girl Scouts. And I showed up at my first day of work with this high expectation that the culture of the company, what it felt like to work there, was going to match the mission of the organization. That it would be a happy, positive, supportive, warm and fuzzy place to work. But I quickly found out that although the work that Girl Scouts did for girls was truly wonderful, the experience of being an employee there at the time was not. It was an organization that over its 100-year history had developed ways of operating that did not allow employees to thrive. It had an extreme hierarchy that made it feel a bit like we were working in a dictatorship. We had almost no autonomy and didn't feel very trusted. I had just graduated from college, but felt like I was being sent back to kindergarten. Innovation had basically come to a standstill because no one felt safe enough to even take the smallest risk. I saw in those years how an unhealthy company culture can dim the light of human potential. But I was lucky enough to eventually become the person in charge. And when I became CEO, I decided to change things and change them quickly we rapidly moved to a radical new way of working. We adopted a practice of allowing employees to work wherever they wanted, whenever they wanted, as long as they got their work done. This resulted in immediate improvements. Employees were more engaged, they were more productive, they were more satisfied, they were healthier, and they performed better at their jobs. They lost weight because they could now manage their time enough to be able to exercise. They reconnected with their families after years of missing events and activities because of an inflexible work schedule. And they excelled at their jobs and found new solutions to old problems. It was the same group of people in the same physical office space with an entirely different culture. And all of a sudden, that potential that had been squashed and dimmed before began to reveal itself. The changes weren't easy, there were definitely challenges, but it showed me what was possible. And now, in my work at New York Tech Meetup, I spend my days interacting not with 100-year-old companies, but with companies that are often less than 100 days old. The startup community looks a lot different. It moves faster, it has less bureaucracy, it has less hierarchy. But startups have challenges with culture too. In the startup world, culture is often not thought about or focused on. It's something that falls way down on the priority list, usually after product and profit and growth. And when culture in startups is thought about, it's usually thought about through the lens of the perks, the superficial symbols that have come to represent startup culture. The ping pong table, the free beer, the free lunches, but a ping-pong table isn't 
culture. And if we fail to recognize that, if companies fail to pay attention to culture from the earliest stages, we're at risk of having an entire new generation of companies follow the same patterns of behavior that companies have been following for decades. Behaviors that are clearly not working very well anymore. A recent Gallup study showed that only 13% of employees worldwide are engaged with their work. And in the US, active disengagement is expected to cost companies between $450 and $550 billion a year. When a survey asked people, do you like what you do each day? Only 20% of people could answer with a strong yes. And in one cross-European study, 60% of people surveyed said that they would switch careers if they could. This doesn't impact just employees, it impacts leaders as well. In a Harvard Medical School study, 96% of leaders surveyed said they felt burned out. And the former Minister of Labor in Germany estimated that it cost German companies over 10 billion euros per year in expenses related to burnout. Work impacts every aspect of our lives, including our physical health. In one survey of 3,000 Swedish employees, it was found that if employees had to work for a bad, ineffective boss, they had a 24% increase in their chance of developing a serious heart problem. If they had to work for that boss for more than four years, their chance of developing a serious heart problem went up 39%. Now, many of us feel very lucky to have a job, usually in a comfortable office, that gives us a paycheck, that helps us fulfill our needs at the most basic levels of Maslow's classic hierarchy. That paycheck helps provide for food and shelter and gives us some sense of security. But we're moving in the direction of expecting more from work. It's as if Maslow's hierarchy is being condensed, and we're expecting to accomplish all of the levels of the hierarchy at once, and all of them through work. We want not just the paycheck and the basic security, but we also want to have a sense of belonging and respect and reach, reach that level of self-actualization. We can point to our overall change in prosperity as one of the reasons for this shift, for this condensing of Maslow's hierarchy. I think, especially in the US, it has something to do with the change in landscape around retirement, with the traditional pension plan virtually going extinct. Young people look ahead to the future and no longer see the glory days of retirement they wonder if they're ever even going to be able to retire. So instead, they think about the fact that they want to enjoy and have a satisfying life now instead of at some random point in the future. I think this condensing also has something to do with the fact that we now have more choice in what we do for work than ever before. Not only can we work for millions of different companies, but technology has enabled us to start our own businesses with little more than a laptop and an internet connection. And finally, all of the research that we're doing in the areas of psychology and sociology and neuroscience is giving us much deeper insight into what helps us truly flourish and thrive. Now, when companies have unhealthy cultures, they often get stuck in these first two levels of hierarchy. They can't seem to get employees past that point of simply working for a paycheck that gives them that basic sense of security. So how do we get companies beyond that? 
How do we get companies to the point where they're helping employees get to every single level of the hierarchy? When you're building a company from scratch, it starts by being intentional. Whether we realize it or not, a culture will grow in a company as soon as it's formed. And it's usually based on the personality, values, and beliefs of the company's founder or early leaders. But there's no guarantee that that culture will be any good or that it will stand the test of growth and time. When we actually do become intentional about building a culture, we often think about it through the lens of values and start with defining our values. And values are an incredibly important construct for creating a framework around the behavior that we intend to have in the organization. But I think even that misses something more fundamental, more essential, something that I missed when I first started exploring this. When we ask ourselves the question of what kind of culture do we want to create for employees, how do we want employees to feel, what we're really examining is this deeper question of well-being. What factors help human beings flourish? Because things like employee engagement and employee satisfaction aren't really driven by a simple single factor like are employees happy. It's driven by a much more complex combination of the factors that lead to human well-being. The construct that I've found that captures this idea the best is a construct that was created by Dr. Martin Seligman, not in the context of work, but just in the context of general human well-being. The construct that he created is called PERMA, and it stands for Positive Emotion, Engagement, Relationships, Meaning, and Accomplishment. Positive relationships, the sense that you feel gratitude, that you get to feel pleasure, that you feel joy, that you feel curiosity. In the workplace, getting to experience these feelings often comes from the interactions that we have with our colleagues. And it also comes from the opportunity to use our strengths at work. In an unhealthy culture, you're oftentimes not given an opportunity to use your strengths. And you have negative interactions with those around you. So you may be a skilled negotiator, but you're never trusted to negotiate. And to top it all, all off, your boss keeps telling you how disappointed he is in you. The next is engagement. Engagement refers to a sense of flow. And you can only achieve that sense of flow when you can focus for an uninterrupted period of time on something that truly engrosses you and, and is something that you're truly interested in. The challenge at work is that in unhealthy cultures, we often can never get to that state of flow because we never have any uninterrupted time. We have colleagues or bosses that continually interrupt us. We are tethered to our email, constantly checking what is coming in even when we're trying to work on another project. And we're often forced to spend time in useless, mind-numbing meetings instead of getting to spend dedicated time concentrating on things that are important and interesting to us. Next, relationships. At work, relationships are incredibly, incredibly important. We spend more of our waking hours at work than doing any other activity. And we know that relationships at work can have both a positive effect on us and a negative effect on us. So we know that people are more likely to be engaged at work when they have a best friend at work. And when Gallup did a study of a million employed workers in the US, they found that the number one reason why people voluntarily leave their jobs is not because they don't like the companies and not because they don't like their actual work, but because they don't like their boss. 
Those relationships have significant impact on our overall sense of well-being and how we feel about all of the other aspects of work. Meaning refers to our sense of having a purpose that is bigger than ourselves. At work, this is essential. We may work because we want to create a better life for our kids. We work because we want to, through our work, make the world better. In a company with an unhealthy culture, what often happens is that that bigger purpose isn't clear. The company might have a goal like being the best or being number one, but that's not really a bigger life purpose. That's a very self-centered purpose within the company. And oftentimes there's also another purpose defined, but that purpose is also self-serving. The purpose is about getting a few people, probably at the top of the company, very, very wealthy. And that doesn't help all of the people in all of the other positions in the company feel like they have meaning through their work. The last is accomplishment. And accomplishment is the one thing that we can often take too far to extremes. We can get too focused on a pure sense of achievement. But accomplishment is still incredibly important. We need to have a sense that we progress, that we learn, that we grow, that we set goals and we're able to accomplish them. In a company with an unhealthy culture, often what happens is that employees are not able to get a sense of making progress and accomplishing their goals because the goals are either unclear or always changing. It's being assigned a project on one day and two days later being told to work on something else and two days after that being told to work on something else and never feeling like any of the work that you do contributes towards getting to a goal. And I took the liberty of adding a sixth letter to Dr. Seligman's model because in my experience, there's a sixth component that has a huge impact on the well-being of employees at work and that's autonomy. As I saw at Girl Scouts, if you have no autonomy, if you have no sense of trust, if employees have no sense of freedom, it undermines your ability to achieve all of the other types of well-being. One of the amazing things about this model to me is that it helps us bring this concept of well-being into work. And we often forget that our workplaces are filled with messy, complicated human beings who have many, many factors that contribute to their well-being. I also like this model because it brings up something incredibly important. That creating a culture isn't just about a company creating the right construct, the right framework for well-being but it's also about understanding the concept that creating a great culture is really a joint venture. It's a joint venture between the company, the construct of the company, and the employees. Because getting to a place of well-being requires that we all have a strong sense of self-awareness and that we all become better self-managers. And this has never been more true. Technology on a daily basis is testing our ability to concentrate and focus. It is shifting our perception of what is urgent. And we are being bombarded by more and more information than ever before. If we want to be able to thrive in this technological age, we have to understand the conditions under which we are able to do that. If you have no sense of what you're good at, what your strengths are, if you don't know how to get to a sense of flow, if you don't know how to build positive relationships or set goals and achieve them, then as an individual, you're unlikely to get to that state of well-being. With self-awareness and self-management, the other component that we see in organizations is that how we each behave, how we manage ourselves, is completely contagious. 
We know from social studies, even outside of the workplace, that our social circle influences us in many different ways. It influences how many calories we eat, how often we exercise, how we see the world. And the same thing is true for behavior in the workplace. When I was at Girl Scouts, after we had implemented this work wherever you want, whenever you want program, I had a few employees come to me because their manager was driving them absolutely crazy. She was emailing them all throughout the night, three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning. She was emailing them all weekend. And they couldn't keep up with this pace of work. When I had the manager come in to talk to me, she didn't quite understand what the problem was at first. She was working when she wanted to and when she felt was best for her. And she had also told her employees not to pay attention to the emails that came in in the middle of the night or came in on the weekends. What she didn't realize, though, was that what she said didn't matter. She was their boss. And to them, she was working hard, and it was their job to keep up with her. And if they didn't keep up with her, they worried that she would see them as not hardworking, that she would see them as unsupportive of the work that she was trying to do. So we came to a compromise at the time because there wasn't a technology that allowed her to schedule her emails to go out only during the workday. So she had to save all of her emails in draft and hit send on them on Monday morning when her employees got back to work. Because even though, yes, three o'clock in the morning might have been her prime time for working, that behavior was contagious and contagious in a very unhealthy way for the other people that she was interacting with. We also see this contagion happen in a very positive way in the workplace. A recent study by Tony Schwartz and Cynthia Porath showed that when leaders exhibit behaviors of sustainable work practices, meaning that they alternate between periods of hard work and renewal, and they actually disconnect once in a while, the employees who work with them benefit as well. Those employees are much more likely to practice the same behaviors. And when they do that, their level of satisfaction went up 55%, and their level of engagement went up 77%. While it could be easy for us to get to this point of our colleagues influencing all of our behavior and wanting to blame everyone else for influencing our behavior, it's important that we also realize that when it comes to well-being, we are often our own worst enemies. Especially as we develop more autonomy, and more and more of us are freelancing. We have to realize that although, yes, we do sometimes have a bad boss to blame for having to respond to email at night and on weekends, sometimes that bad, demanding boss is actually you. You are the one who has developed a habit of never putting down your phone and constantly standing in line somewhere and checking to see if emails have come in. You're the person who does email before doing other important work that you have to do. And you're the person who has become slightly addicted to being busy. We have opportunities every single day to practice self-management. And we need to take more of those opportunities and do that work. So what if you're in a company that has a bad culture and you want to adopt more of this practice of well-being? What's the first step? The first step to me is to understand what you're up against. How big your task is going to be has to do with how big your organization is, how old it is, how long the culture has been horrible, how compelling of a reason you have to make the change, and how many people and who believe that reason. So if you have a compelling reason, but the only people who buy into that reason are a couple people at the top or a couple people at the bottom, but you haven't been able to get to a tipping point, it's very unlikely that you're going to change. If you decide to change and work on changing, 
which I think is well worth the effort. The next big step is looking at how well your company embraces these concepts of well-being because they really get at the fundamental things that human beings need in order to thrive. When we focus on well-being, we put ourselves in a place of being able to tap into what is currently hidden human potential. And if we're able to accomplish as much as we are when only 13% of our workforce is engaged, imagine how much we'd be able to thrive and what big problems we'd be able to solve if those numbers were reversed. The way we're working isn't working, and it won't change unless we question it and fix it. We forget that all of the constructs of work that we live with, the way we structure our companies, the way we build our culture, the relationship between employer and employee, those things didn't always exist. We created them. And that means that we also have the power to change them. And I hope you will. Thank you.